Next, we will have um, a round of lightning talks. We have three lightning talks. Again, like earlier, they will be 10 minutes um, back to back to back. So three lightning talks, and then we'll have a 10 minute uh, Q&A where we can ask questions to the three speakers. And then we will follow that immediately with another set of three talks um, back to back to back. So um, without further ado, our first talk will actually be from uh, Adrian Phillips and David Castillo, if I, I hope I'm pronouncing your names correctly. Um, and they have this really exciting talk that I'm really excited for. Um, so yeah, I'll let them take it away. Hello, everybody. Everybody can see this? Yep. Okay, so my name is Adrian, and together with David, my friend, we're going to present you this project that we've been working on for a while. It's a wave bioreactor, and uh, well, it's been developed by a bunch of volunteers, a lot of volunteers, nobody got paid. Uh, some of them put like maybe hundreds of hours, and these are some of the names there. Uh, on the bottom, you can see we have the uh, URL where you can find more information if you would like to have some more. So what's a bioreactor, and uh, why do you need it? Well, a bioreactor is basically a a growth chamber where you can grow your organism, your little monsters there, they have to be happy. Usually you control the temperature, you control the pH and some other things there. The wave one, it's the, the second one in the picture, it's a wave bioreactor. And it's, uh, it's actually, uh, what's, what's different about that? Hey, sorry to interrupt. I don't think we're seeing your screen. Um... Okay. Now we can see it, right? Yes, we can see uh, the presentation. Um, yep, if you could hit play or present. Yes. Yep, uh, perfect. Okay. So I'm on page two, we're talking about the wave bioreactor. So now you can see the, uh, the picture there. So the wave one, it's actually a bag that is rocking on the platform. And that's good because you can do more advanced cell types like mammalian cells. Otherwise, if you use the, the typical one, you're gonna shear the, the cell. So that's not gonna work. Now, uh, we use the bioreactors or different other types of, uh, of chambers like this for making wine, cheese, bread, etc., etc. But with this one, you can do so much more than this. You can do antibodies, uh, you can do growth factors. If you believe in vaccines, you can do vaccines. If you want to turn toads into people or vice versa, you can do viral vectors for in vivo genetic editing. You can do biofuels or uh, uh, tissue engineering and regenerative uh, medicine. So um, why do you want to have a bioreactor, especially if you are a community bio lab? Well, uh, of course, you have to keep everybody happy. And for that, you have to do projects, experiments. Probably the largest cost of experiments are the reagents. And some of the most expensive ones are the molecular reagents. Now, the problem is they are expensive, especially if you order them in small quantity. They, uh, uh, they have a limited shelf life, so you have to reorder them all over uh, many, many times. They are expensive. You have to FedEx them because most of them will, um, will depreciate in time. So they have to be either shipped on dry ice or overnight. Um, there are importations, international uh, restrictions. So there are other problems. And the other thing is like many times they are denied to, denied to be shipped to smaller or personal labs. Like if you call New, New England uh, um, uh, Bioscience, and you ask them, you say, well, I'm a community lab. I want to have a, you know, a reverse trans uh, transfer as you're going to see what they say. So we can solve this problem if you create our own reagents. So we can have them fast, faster than the shipping. We can have them cheap, much, much like orders of magnitude, and we can have plenty of them. So that's the justification for, uh, for this project. Now, when we start up, we, we looked at several things. In order to be accessible, it has to have a low cost. So it has to be affordable. So maybe under $500. I think at this point it's probably under $400. So we got to that one. They have to be reusable. Some of them you have to throw the bags every time and it's like $500. And we wanted them to be user friendly, especially for, uh, for the reagent production. We want to have like a big, nice button in the middle that you click on and you say, you know, make tact polymers very simple. Um, it, it's a fairly complicated project because it's a lot, like lots of mini projects. You have to do a rocker or an optical density reader, uh, pH control system, etc. cetera, lots of them. And there were some setbacks because of the pandemic, you know, things that uh, our go-to fabrication uh, um, 
people who were closed, the stuff that we ordered never came and, and so on. So normal stuff. Now, these are the achievements so far. So we have a control board, which is fairly, it's, it's, a, it's a custom one and we populated and we tested that it's working. Uh, we have a number of associated optional projects and one of them was the Olito Shaker. So we did a control board for that. And we are working for, uh, to do a potential step for uh, reading the oxygen. We have a software. So this is a, a remote control um, and monitoring thing. So you can keep your bioreactor in your dungeons and you can, uh, you can monitor and control it from your living room if you want to. This is a screenshot where we show you how you can see the, the temperature. And um, David, if you can help with this. Yeah, thank you, Adrian. And hello, everybody. I'm David. Um, so in order to produce this um, badly needed reagent, this molecular reagent, we decided to test a, a, a system that has been already around since 2012. And we use the PDON system that uses uh, histidine kinase acoupled to uh, the blue light receptor that was isolated from another, um, another bacteria. So in here I'm presenting what we did at the beginning. It's a proof of concept. So uh, we tested the M cherry protein uh, that you can look around uh, in, in the red flask. And we induce it uh, with just a simple LED array of, of just projecting blue light. And after a, around 16 hours, we'll be able to see quite a, a, a strong uh, signal uh, that is producing the red fluorescent protein uh, that is subconscious in that, in that system. So can we go to the next one, please? And here I'm presenting uh, what, we, what we already have. So this is a, um, an idea that with the COVID-19 um, emergency, we decided to test why if we cannot um, subclone in this system the three most needed molecular reagent that we need, that are need for the, the, the COVID detection. So one is at this point we have tree construction and one is corresponding to a DNA polymerase that is, uh, is a PFU SSOD fusion. The other one is TAC polymerase and the other one is a uh, reverse transcriptase that was uh, designed by Alex Kleno from uh, People Jockey. Uh, so we were successful in doing those constructions. So this is where uh, we have like a one of the early early things. You can see the bag in there. It's a simple a silicone bag. It's auto flavorable. You can buy it at Costco for about ten dollars. Uh, you can see the array of, of LEDs on the wall there uh, and the uh, uh, 3D printed wrapper. Uh, these are some of the mechanical assembly. This is where the probably the, our biggest problem there. We still making changes to that. You can see the box. You can see the peristaltic pump, the white ones on the right. And you see, can see the platform. Um, David? Yeah. So see, here we have the first result from one of the first uh, two clone protein. Here is um, the system that we tested using a commercial LED. It, it is nothing special. And a cynical bag with a regular LB media, LB Miller. And we were able to isolate a PFU of fusion, which is uh, one of the easiest to be purified using the system. So we were uh, capable of demonstrating that using the system, we were able to use uh, the blue light in order to induce large quantities and more ca capable of, of isolating them, irregular and nickel NTA column. So here the, the arrow is, is showing uh, the amount of the purified protein. Okay, so this is a look inside the box kind of thing. Uh, so you can see the uh, the electronics. You can see on the right there. You can see the, uh, the turkey pan there where we put the uh, the actual uh, bag. Uh, you can see a couple of uh, uh, you know temperature sensor, or pH sensor uh, in in the front in there. So uh, this is kind of how it looks like now. Of course, it's not going to be made of it. Um, and here we actually we we experimented with uh, pouring our own silicone uh, containers. You can see it on the left side the corner there and actually works. You can see some of the additional projects and additional outcomes, we call them residuals that resulted from this project, like an orbital shaker, the red one on the right, uh, the optical density reader, uh, a flow cell uh, on, the, on the right there and an exhaust air filter to, to cut down the smell of the E. coli. Okay, I just wanted to say there's one minute left. Okay, so this is... Um... Uh, well, it's another alternative idea that we are exploring is trying to explore different types of, of media uh, for uh, isolating instead of using metallic uh, um, 
uh, resin, like for example, nickel NTA, we're using a different type of, of, of approach, like for example, uh, nanocellulose, that uh, we know that there are certain moiety that can be attached to it and it's much more cheaper. So as a summary, we can, oh yeah. As a summary, we can say that at this point, we have three uh, trains that are capable of synthesizing um, three of the most needed reagents. And we have several versions of the rocker. Um, and we have a dedicated PCB that are capable of integrating multiple sensors and actuators for actually uh, being controlled with the software that can remotely control uh, different operating function. And from those multiple, we were able, uh, we have already been able to test the temperature, the temperature control, sorry, the pH control and the growth flow cells for measuring the optical density. And well, of, of course, there's a lot of, 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 of more work to do like completing and integrating all the system and well, uh, integrating other, other um, monitors and uh, sensor that we are planning to incorporate it for later. So thank you so much. And uh, thank you for Joggle that uh, at one point uh, in the middle of the project contributed with a mini grant. And thank you to all the volunteers that work with us. And again, the website that you can find more information about this. And thank you to Jenny Molloy because she worked on, the, on another uh, reactor that uh, was an inspiration for us. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, and I would just like to thank you for the chat. Jenny Malloy has come up several times today, um, so that's exciting. Uh, but uh, now we have a, a chat um, about building better protocol visualizations, and I think that's really important um, as a lot of biology relies on these protocols. So I'm very excited for this next um, chat. So um, if Eric and Eugenie, if that's Sorry if I mispronounced, could um, prepare and give your talk now. Hello, do you guys see a duck? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Um, so the title of our talk is Building Better Protocol Visualizations and Why It Matters. And so um, the premise of our talk is that uh, there are kind of two, there are kind of some very significant reasons why synthetic biology is more difficult and less attractive to high school students than, for example, working with uh, electronics and Arduinos. Me and my partner, Ujani, want to solve these problems by making existing protocols more accessible. Um, so we'd like to note that complexity alone does not prevent like, teenagers from getting interested in making things. Um, this is a very like extreme example, but high school students have built things like nuclear reactors just because they had like a tutorial to follow and because their parents were like willing to buy them like um, supplies. And up here you can see like several different like Arduino projects that were all created by high school students. Um, but there are some like challenges that are specific to synthetic biology that um, electronics doesn't have and those are what we'd like to focus on solving. So the first challenge that we face is the accessibility of these protocols. Um, a lot of these biology protocols, as contrasted to the Arduino experiments that we talked about earlier, are really difficult to understand, especially for high school students. Um, sometimes they require proprietary reagents and they can be seemingly irreproducible. And as contrasted to Arduino projects or electronic projects, there aren't a lot of resources available for students at different levels. Um, this is what we kind of called going beyond the strawberry DNA. With biology and with wet lab experimentation, there's just introductory basics and then what's seemingly impossible. Whereas with DIY electronics, you can type into Google 100 cool things to do with Arduino, um, a lot of Arduino projects, instructables, and you can get a lot of different projects to do that are step by step. Electronics, people who are passionate about electronics have those resources to do that, but people who are uh, passionate about biology do not find this in the wet lab. And students, especially teenagers, like doing their own projects, not always serving as pipette machines for adults or following the classroom. And to really get passionate about something as we draw an analogy to with electronics, it's important to be able to do self-research and have accessible protocols. And it's much harder for students to do with biology. Yeah, so we, we're working on a solution. Um, 
And the idea behind this is we want to turn existing academic papers into projects because there are like a lot of cool things out there within like academic papers and existing protocols, but they're not accessible because they're static, they're intimidating, and they don't feel like it's something that you can do at a community lab. Um, but if we could turn these things into projects, it would um, create a lot more possibilities for people who have maybe mastered basic lab techniques, but don't, like don't know where to go from there. Um, and so going back to like our electronics analogy, um, the Arduino Uno is an extremely popular like microcomputer, um, but its rise in popularity really only began with, or at least in my opinion, it began with the creation of a schematic builder called Fritzing. And what Fritzing does is it creates very like universal visualizations of circuit diagrams that people could reference. So all of a sudden you didn't need to like look up technical specifications, for like the voltage amounts and stuff. You could just look at the diagram and you could be certain that what you were building was correct. We started to think about what something similar to this would look like for biology. Do you guys hear anything? Um, no. I, no, sorry. Yeah, so basically I'm just going through a demo of our application. Um, and here I'm looking through like a protocol. Um, yeah. And if you want to share the audio, when you share screen, you just have to choose share audio too. Yeah, okay. I'm going to try and do that. It's like on the bottom left of the share screen button. Um, it's a little bit clear, but we still don't get the full picture. Um, what Simplifier does is, is that it allows us to write this kind of simplified specialized commands that describe a protocol. Here it's describing the different reagents you need to conduct it. And it allows us to take these procedures, um, and of course you can write these into the browser as well. And if you submit the objects and you submit the procedures, what it does is it makes a walkthrough. The walkthrough has two parts. It has arrows, which are transferring liquids, easy peasy, and it has um, incubation, which is just waiting for a certain amount of time. Yeah, okay, so that was our demo. Um, and basically the idea behind our application is that it turns existing academic papers into projects. It allows people to kind of like sketch out existing protocols in like a more visual format that um, students and like enthusiasts can understand better. And these should be like embeddable into like websites and like blogs and different like tutorials. Um, yeah, and so if you just look at the diagram, you can tell like what reagents are necessary and like what operations you would have to like conduct. But if you take the time to like scroll through it, you can also get um, enough of like the details so that you can conduct the protocol itself. Yeah, and so I guess the rest of the time is just um, if you guys have any questions or you'd like to see like different features um, that we can develop into this, uh, feel free to like raise your hand or something. Um, well, I think just to keep um, on time, we can save the questions for the, the next period. Oh, um, yeah, we have a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, but very exciting and very interesting. I, I have a lot of questions. Um, Thank you. This has been exciting. Um, so next, our next lightning talk um, will be with um, Nini, if you're available. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing names. No, but... you're, you're pronouncing my name just fine. Don't okay. worry. <laughs> All right. So yeah, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Hello, everyone. My name is Nini ortiz Valles. And I am from the Roberto Becker Lab here in Merida, Mexico. Today, I'm going to talk to you to you guys about an emerging field in science that is called bioelectricity. This research is being currently 
led a path by the group of the Dr. Michael Levin and in the Wise Institute at Harvard. Bioelectricity is a really interesting field because um, bioelectricity can regulate gene expression from a top bottom perspective. So in the future, it could be a very powerful tool for bioengineering and synthetic biology. I will share now my screen. Uh, uh, so the topic of the talk is going to be bioelectricity and information processing in biological systems. So the ones that went to my previous talk, bear with me, just this slide, because it's the same. <laughs> so what is bioelectricity? Bioelectricity refers to the ion multiforces that arise in membranes thanks to differences in ion concentrations. These differences come from the expression of different proteins that make the membrane more permeable to certain ions. And in animals, um, they all, all, all cells have a type of junction called gap junction that essentially looks like a little straw that only lets, allows um, small ions and molecules to pass through. So these differences in expression of proteins generate uh, different distributions of ions that, that could look like a pattern because these differences generate um, a membrane voltage. So it's a, a pattern, that, a, a bioelectrical pattern similar, similar to that of neurons. However, bioelectricity operates in a longer time frame, and these patterns have a spatial temporal um, dynamic because they are not persistent, they change, and they essentially um, can control gene expression, gene, regu gene regulatory networks, the epigenetic landscape of cells. They can change how an organism will re regenerate, and also they can induce um, the complete patterning of complete organs just changing uh, these, um, these patterns during development. Um, so how will bioelectricity release information? Uh, the mechanisms that transduce bioelectrical signals um, as second messenger cas cascades arrive through gap junctions, the ion channel and pumps I previously mentioned, and mechanical signals that can also um, Mm, open, um, open, uh, make make uh, ions pass through these mechanosensitive channels, and this uh, thing essentially when um, an, an, a channel opens, you can change the membrane voltage. It these bioelectrical patterns generate um, pH gradients, ion fluxes, and small electrical fields. Uh, they for example, in a cell, when you know that um, muscle cells need a, an, a flux of, of calcium to, so the myosin fibers can slide and contract. So um, these electrical signals generate different effects in tissues. Care uh, emergencies, I think. And, um, they affect the exp expression of transcriptional factors, which can lead a cell to take the, like, um, like differentiation, for example, um, pre-potent cells tend to be more depolarized. That means that the inner compartment of a cell has a slightly positive charge than um, differentiated cells, or for example, neurons, have a very high, um, Voltage that means that they are like high, like sorry, uh, more hyperpolarized, which means that they have a more negative membrane potential. Uh, by electricity, is something that is evolutionally conserved through, so you can find it in both in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. For example, Bacillus subtilis biofilms need use a, an electrical signal to produce adaptation weight. So the metabolic activities of the cells in the center and in the outer sheets of the biofilm can be synchronized. So the cells in the center won't die. Plants use it to sense when a, when a herbivore is eating them. They relay the, this information as a 
through uh, calcium signals and mechanosensitive channels. And um, cancers um, are the most depolarized cells. They also are being studied. I mean, the, there are um, iron channels that are specific to cancer cells. They are now being studied as biomarkers for cancer. And um, by, well, tissues, when they regenerate, usually uh, become more positively charged. For example, this is a Xenopus uh, embryo that, that was cut. And this, um, the fluorescence that is emitted um, correlates with the polarization. For the adequate patterning of craniofacial features, uh, they have, these researchers have, have found that um, you need a, um, if this specific pattern is generated uh, through a stage in the development of the embryo, the face will, will actually pattern. Okay, if it's not, you get aberrant expression of patterning genes. Uh, they uh, tinkled with it and found that only establishing the, the, the patterns of expression of ion channels can um, fix the defects. Not, so you wouldn't have to actually um, change directly the genes to uh, change the patterning in the, in the organism. So through bioelectricity, you can target gene regulatory networks and morphologies in biological systems. So this is a field that it's not really being explored that much in synthetic biology. But if we all were to, to work together towards building new tools to search more of these patterns in living animals, we could get really powerful insights. For example, we may, maybe could generate or, or know or understand how these biophysical cues are connected to these gene regulatory networks, engineer things from bottom up and top down perspectives. So it will make, for example, organ tissue engineering easier. You wouldn't have to, um, to use um, a 3D printer to actually produce an organ. You could just um, give the specific electrical signals to cells so they can generate a complete organ. For example, in this embryo, they change it, the, the, the bioelectrical pattern in the membrane at a specific stage, and they made, just by changing that, the animal generated a complete eye that is innervated and works. So understanding how all of this comes together could help us um, change our view of synthetic, synthetic biology, maybe uh, generate new treatments for birth effects, or understand, for example, how um, animals evolved certain structures, um, like dinosaurs. Why did they, they um, they, they, they evolve it like, like birds and how, how they, they, they change uh, from one form to another. Um, in planaria, for example, I, these are double-headed planaria. You, only by blocking gap junctions, when you cut these worms, these worms usually regenerate with a high fidelity, their head and tail when they are cut. But if you block the gap junctions, you um, can, you, you, you change how the animal uh, regenerates and without touching specific genes. So it's probably a really powerful tool for the future. Uh, other scientists are exploring maybe um, generating complete synthetic organs that could actually help us to cure diseases. So it is a broad area that, is, that I believe could help us change um, a lot of stuff that is currently being done in biology. In biology. So um, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we have about thirty seconds. Ah, uh, thank you. That, that's all. Uh, thank oh. you for listening to me. And I let's. I hope that this excites you as as much as, as it does to, as I as I do. Sorry. <laughs> um. Thank you. Thank you. And um, you. Can we all just share our uh, gratitude for our three groups of speakers? That was incredible. Um, you can unmute if you'd like to clap or anything. 
Um, but yeah, I really, really enjoyed the three talks. Um, right now, we're going to open it up to questions and answers. So if you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat or unmute yourself and um, ask away. I have a question for, for Eric. Um, uh, some chat about protocol designing in the in the chat here. Uh, and I was just curious, um, you know, a lot of people are are trying different ways to do this. And what is, what is the hardest problem to solve? Like, what, what is the hardest thing about making a good tool like this? I think, like, the scope of the project needs to be pretty comprehensive for it to be useful. Um, because if you're just looking at, like, a very, like, small set of, like, operations, there's not really, like, a lot of, like, useful things you can do with that. So it's definitely something that needs to be, like, developed, like, pretty, like, fully which we don't have yet um, before it can like start being like more useful to like other people. All right, uh, do we have any further questions? Um, I had a couple questions, but I wanna open it up. Okay then, uh, so for thinking about protocols, uh, is the goal to just automate, you know, let's say paper to uh, some readable format? Um, or is it to, you know, have someone go in and build a protocol that's easier to use? Uh, so one of the ideas that's been proposed for like this type of thing is like, human in the loop automation, which is like the idea that one person can like design the protocol and just like give it to like a technician to like carry out. But obviously that's not like super like enjoyable for like the person who's like just like doing the pipetting, right? And so like kind of the idea behind our thing is like this allows people to choose between different projects and like get a sense of like what each project is about in terms of like what you're actually doing before you like embark on like getting the supplies and stuff. Thank you. Very cool. Very cool. Um, we still have another seven, six minutes for question and answer if there are more questions out there. And it looks like Eric has posted an interest form. Uh, so Nini, one of the questions that I had is uh, where do you think the most potential lies in bioelectricity and how we could harness it? Like, where do you think um, that would do the most good? I mean, um, in synthetic biology, imagine um, building 3D multicellular systems from scratch. It will be like a life-changing uh, thing to happen to humanity, I think, because you could make artificial cells that produce the specific uh, um, protein you're lacking or neurotransmitter you need to be healthy or maybe build, I don't know, different morphologies, synthetic morphologies that actually work and not, are not made uh, out of 3D printed matrices. So we currently lack much knowledge about many stuff that actually happens downstream of the bioelectrical patterns. But if we had more people working on it in the world, I believe that the power of the people can make things move really fast. So maybe um, I think that, sorry, I went sideways with the answer, but, <laughs> but, but I believe that, that, that um, 3D multicellular patterning is, is in synthetic biology is the greatest thing that, that could happen for, for all of us. Wow, thank you. Um, Corinne, uh, you had a question. I don't it's know if you- It's the same as yours. Oh, sorry. Sorry <laughs> no, for stealing it's so your good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, but we also had a question from Kevin and um, 
I don't know if you want to unmute and ask or. Yeah, I can, I can unmute, I think. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Um, so my question um, for Adrian and David, like in the realm of open source bioreactors, which I think has seen like, I don't know, maybe 10 years of work. Um, I think I've, like I've seen, I've heard like bits and pieces of things over the years about uh, different bioreactor projects. So I'm wondering, uh, you mentioned Jenny Malloy as like one past reference. And then I'm wondering what you feel like your you know, contribution is there. Um, and then also like what can we look to as a future, like what needs improvement from your perspective in these like areas of bioreactor, uh, uh, I guess, uh, <laughs> making or something. Thank you, Kevin. That, that's a very good question. So, uh, first of all, we didn't want to build a bioreactor. We looked around to see if we can use anything from the uh, open, open space there. And yes, there have been a number of projects uh, throughout the years, but actually only two of them were fairly, fairly recent. And uh, one of them was an iGEM, and then Jenny, Jenny's uh, bioreactor was based on the iGEM one. So, so that was kind of the the most uh, uh, state-of-the-art kind of bioreactor. The, pro the, the reason why we decided to, to build another one was because that was a, uh, uh, a bacterial bioreactor. And we wanted to make sure that we can do viral vectors. We wanted to make sure that we grow human cells and, and stuff like that. And for that, you need a wave bioreactor. The other reason was that, uh, yeah, the, the, I see lots of publications, but the price uh, tax for most of them is like two or three thousand dollars. So we wanted to do something that's that's accessible, and uh, and we we managed. I think we managed to do that by doing uh, several things. One that we eliminated pretty much all the display electronics that are on the uh, on the box itself. So no no awkward quirky keyboards that you have to do, and that allow us to to also save on the money um, on the on the components. Uh, the other idea was we found this uh, autoclavable uh, uh, bags that are in the commerce right now, which nobody nobody thought or nobody had that idea before. Uh, and uh, well, moving the the whole thing instead of running anything on the box itself, uh, except for the actuation software, moving it on the on the uh, on the desktops that that was that was a that was a big thing because it gives you all the power of the calculation of the desktop plus all the possibility of doing graphics, capturing stuff, and even uh, running optimization algorithms. The other, re the other thing that I think we did, uh, which is different, when the pandemic came, we realized, okay, this is, a, this is a generic device that you can do a lot of things, but we said, okay, now we can see this, this immense hunger for uh, reverse transcript tests, which is probably most of you know that it's kind of first, uh, first uh, uh, reagent that you need uh, if you run the CDC uh, test. And we decided, we said, well, can we make a bioreactor for that we can do reagents, but we can ship the reagents and the protocol and do everything for people, including the, the, all the steps to do this. So, so that was the goal. And for at least for the first three reagents, it's, it's working. And if you go back to free genes, they, they do have actually about 15 enzymes that we can take and we can also add to the to the bioreactor. So so that will be like uh, uh, kind of like a short term development. That's kind of doing exactly what we've done and and, and moving it uh, farther uh, along. I'm not sure if maybe David can can add to this. Um, he has the big dreams there. So, sorry, uh, but we are actually out of time for questions and answers for this period. But uh, please feel free to add to the chat here or in the Slack. Um, I think this is, you know, the beginning of some really interesting conversations and great conversations.